I'm going to present a, 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 an idea about holiness linked into the category person. And I'm going to be sketching out some other positions like Husserl, for example, but um, it's not, uh, I'm, in the interest of clarity, I've kind of, uh, haven't, haven't, I'm not going to present a subtle reading of Husserl. It's a, it's a rather crude reading, I suppose, in a way, but it's, it, it, it serves my purpose for this afternoon's lecture, simply in order to sharpen up the, uh, or clarify what I'm actually trying to say about, about it. So I apologize in advance for uh, the rather sort of um, bland presentation of, of, of Husserl and perhaps some other positions, but it is in the interests of a sort of sharper clarity for now. So behind my talk is an understanding of holiness that I can't develop here, but it's a project on the phenomenology of holiness. Uh, that understands holiness as a proclivity of persons towards verticality. And um, that interesting discussion we had earlier about verticality and openness, that's most interesting that I need to think about and develop in my own mind. Uh, this is part of a larger project on holiness that asks, asks two questions. So my project asks two questions. Of whom is there holiness? Of whom is holiness such an orientation? towards verticality and secondly of what is holiness and appearance of what is holiness and appearance so I, I structure my project around those two questions um, so is holiness only within a theological anthropology no I argue we need to understand holiness as a philosophical anthropology and what is the place of holiness in the history of civilizations? And I think we can abductively infer holiness uh, through its instantiations in a, in a kind of, a, on the model of Peter Brook's idea of, of um, holy theater uh, I was thinking of here. So the, the two questions then, of whom is there holiness and of what? Um, now, I have some preliminary remarks before I get into what I want to say. The, the epoche affords a promising account uh, to describe the appearance of holiness in human life, but an account that can only be preliminary because of the problem that the transcendental ego, at least in one formulation, remains essentially untouched by the encounter. The transcendental ego offers too weak an account to make sense of the ways in which human life claims holiness or encounters holiness. We need to develop a notion of person as one who can be changed or for whom the journey through life is one of transformation and orientation or structure of the person towards verticality. I'm now rethinking this perhaps towards openness, but um, I have to think more about that. It is not that the, the transcendental account of the self uh, cannot give us an account, a notion of holiness. Historically, we have a very strong Neoplatonic view of the self in which holiness is understood as flight, that the flight of the self to its true home uh, in transcendence, Plotinus' flight of the alone to the alone. But this esoteric perspective cannot provide the contemporary philosophical resource we need to present an account of holiness of persons embodied and embedded in webs of social and political relationship. The formal individualism of the transcendental ego of the phenomenological reduction cannot give us the thick textured account of person that we require to understand the presence of holiness. I should also say that I'm not going to be um, drawing on Indic models of person here either. I was thinking of doing so, but it just makes the whole thing too cumbersome and, and complicated to bring in a comparative philosophical dimension. So I'll be restricting my remarks to within the phenomenological tradition. But the transcendental view is not the only view available of persons. There is a notion of person developed within a legal framework, initially in Roman law in the West, as a possessor of certain rights and obligations, along with an account of holiness as the sacred man, the homo sacer, uh, 
that Agamben has developed. If the transcendental or platonic view entails the, the invisible self as detached witness, then the legal view entails the visible self or per son, the mask through which pair the voice is heard, sonare. These two conceptualizations of person as transcendental ego or as a legal category, both fall short of an account of, per, of, 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 of holiness. Uh, both fall short if an account of holiness is to have any positive contemporary philosophical valence. Holiness as orientation, existential reality, and motivating force entails a normative view of person as narrative embodiment. We are born into frameworks and webs of social relationship that precede and exceed us. Within these webs, persons have an orientation to verticality articulated in the stories we tell about ourselves and in our social action. Both the legal view and the transcendental view of person are problematic because of the for whom of holiness necessitates going beyond both legal framework where person is a mask and person as transcendental, transcendental self or invisible essence. Holiness and its philosophical justification need to be articulated as the affirmation of person embodied, temporal and desiring. Neither the, the legal definition nor the transcendental view is sufficient to answer the question, who are you? Because each is the negation of the other and we need to question both. There is an important, uh, dis, there is an, an importance to the category of the person uh, in understanding holiness, not only because of dignity and the rights discourse thereby implied as Hans Joas argues, but because of the orientation to verticality and perception of the world in the mode of holiness. I therefore wish to develop an argument focused on the person that the category of the person entails the apprehension of holiness and holiness only makes sense within the sphere of persons. That may be an obvious point, but it wasn't to me when I thought of it. Um, thus holiness needs to be integrated within a philosophical anthropology as constitutive of what it is to be human. So from transcendental ego to existential body or being. <clears throat> While we take for the epoche from Husserl in the first instance as a way of circumventing the problem, problematic questions of existence or non-existence that have stymied thought, we need to raise questions about the transcendental ego. The transcendental ego is not a person, but the pure subjectivity of witnessing the flow of experience. On the Husserlian view, each of us is a transcendental ego, but this is not what is entailed by the category person, nor is it the same as the individual, a point that Emmanuel Husserl makes, um, the individual can be appropriated within oneself, whereas the category of the person who becomes a you for the other is distinct. So Husserl makes this interesting distinction between individual and um, um, person. The individual of the transcendental subject of transcendental phenomenology is purely formal, not the flesh and blood, to return to Emmanuel Falk's uh, opening remarks, not the flesh and blood person that desires, has intentions, and is embedded within a web of relationships. For herself, the transcendental ego remains an isolated subject while he acknowledges that the subject is embedded within the life world, Husserl is not a pure Platonist. This embeddedness does not mean a direct engagement with world, but rather a process of inference whereby I, as the meditating transcendental ego, infer the transcendental ego of the other over there, Dadruban over there. This is all from Cartesian meditations. This is the only Husserl that I've used in for this. All this is done with the super suspending the natural attitude and the adoption of, of phenomenological science. 
Now, because of the opaque epoche, the deep subject of consciousness of transcendental ego can survey the stream of the cogitaciones and moving out of the natural attitude into the phenomenological mode of analysis that we've heard about can understand the essences that constitute the objects of consciousness and reflexively intuit the essence of the self as the transcendental ego. Now, on this view, holiness is theoretically a cogitatum, an intellectual object, namely the idea or intuition of perfectibility or even of God as the intentional object for the soul. To get some leverage on, this, on the category of holiness, then we need to describe a shift, but, sorry, but to get some leverage on the category, we need to describe a shift from the transcendental ego to existential encounter, from disembodied self to embodied person. Phenomenology in the 20th century has provided three accounts or redescriptions of person as other than transcendental ego, or at least within this tradition. Heidegger's Dasein, Merleau-Ponty's Embodiment or Flesh, developed by Michel Henry on Streets Johnson, and the Curse Narrative, positions that have been modified mostly in the Francophone world with accounts of pre-linguistic experience by Claude Romano and co-belonging view of person by Husserl and lived embodiment by Falk. Heidegger's Dasein in particular is, is critical of inadequate concepts of person from Aristotle's rational animal and Christianity's person as imago dei. I don't have time to describe these positions here, but we'll focus on a view that might be called a perspective of trans-narrative embodiment, which, um, in which person is not not only as embodied, but whose personal narratives are intertwined with the historical narratives of the ambient society. We're born into place and time, and my story is bound up with the story of us all, with the collective story of the culture in which I happen to be born. So holiness and person. If phenomenology is letting be seen that which shows itself in itself, then what shows itself regarding the person in phenomenological attention is not a monad-like ego, but rather a Dasein, a being in the world. What was a virtue, the suspension of the question of being behind appearances, given in the epoche, is now revealed to be a hindrance to a deeper understanding of the nature of the human. Suspending the question of being does not allow us to get at the true nature of human life, Whereas for Heidegger, the analytic of Dasein does, because it begins with what we ourselves are. We ourselves are the entities to be analysed. And the characteristics of such a study, which is ourselves, are not properties as will be attributed to things. But holiness demands a thicker account of human reality, as, to use the metaphorical language, its roots are deep in the very nature of life itself. It's another theme that I can't develop here. But for the moment, we can see with Heidegger the different direction of his thinking that, that his thinking takes from the cautious detachment of Husserlian phenomenology. Within the Heideggerian framework, we might offer a thesis that holiness is Dasein's comportment towards world in the mode of attention to perfectibility. The future projection of Dasein, its future orientation, that for Heidegger is being towards death, could be redescribed in terms of human orientation or comportment towards perfectibility, and so towards life. Heidegger himself implicitly recognizes this in his lectures on the phenomenology of religious life. Dasein's authenticity, its uh, Eigentlichkeit, is being towards death and living in the awareness of its negation as death. This is not a pessimistic view for Heidegger, but a realism that ensures the authenticity of Dasein, as we saw in our reading group last year. But while this grim telos delivers a view of Dasein as being in the world in an authentic mode, we should not be dazzled by the power of this idea as other configurations of Dasein are possible. 
One important counter move is Claude Romano's emphasis not on death, but on, but on birth as determinant of being human. What characterizes life is, is the event, which simply is without being a property or ontic attribute, such as lightning, rain, the train arriving at the station, or the apple falling. The human subject is thus the advenant, adven, advenant to anglicize um, the neologism coined by Romano, advenant, I imagine he would say, uh, to whom events occur and for whom life is an adventure from birth. Quote, advenant, advenant is a term of selfhood itself in its advening. The event that is always on the way to my own advent to myself from the events that happen to me and through which I become, through which I become, end quote. The human being is a condition of becoming through being open to what happened, to events that have gone by us. And so the human adventure is openness to temporality in which what is characteristic is not a terminus a quo, but a terminus ad quem from which. Of all events, the event of birth marks our entry into the world and constrains the events that comprise my life, a life that depends upon the event of birth. And I have a quote from Romano in the handout, but I don't think I'll read out here. So translating the Romano into the kind of language I wish to develop, we might want to say that this indicates that what Romano calls the adventure that is a life, my life, is constrained by the originary event of my birth that allows me to become myself. And only birth confers this upon me. What Romano calls anonymity of birth therefore falls outside of the authentic or inauthentic distinction that marks Dasein as the point of origin from which all possibilities of a life emerge. The person's becoming, the formation of selfhood, is defined by the event of birth that is prior to the formation of selfhood. And this selfhood that is allowed by the event of birth is the human reality and capacity for change. Quote, the power to refashion myself differently, starting from the events that punctuate my adventure, end quote. So the narrative of a life is constrained by the event of birth from which unfolds all possibilities and trajectories of that life. Thus, we have two poles uh, given the phenomenological precedence, birth by Romano and death by Heidegger. The person is a being from birth in the one case and a being towards death in the other. This framing of a person's life, being born and dying, is a minimal structure within which each of us lives. It is the condition of being in the world, without which no account of the human can be articulated, both birth and death as framing events, if death can be so named, are indices of meaning that give semantic density of a life, even prior to its linguistic encoding, and socialization. These two poles are universal as both demanding meaning in that their presence raises existential questions for Dasein and resisting of meaning in that in themselves they reveal nothing other than themselves. As pure event, birth or death are not self-revealing and their meaning can only be approached indirectly to the degree that they are brought into the realm of human intentionality of human language and bodily comportment or habitus. Meaning generated by these events is always culturally mediated, embodied in ways of life that shapes the basic human responses to them. The joy of birth and the grief of bereavement are immediate human responses to these events that are always culturally mediated. There's no pure birth or pure death outside of cultural expectation and in framing even while the existential reality of such events is in some ways stands askance of cultural forms in their immediacy. Human persons bear witness to birth and death certainly as event, as a there is, but bring these events into the realm of meaning. 
Holiness as, is a realm of meaning then into which the events of birth and death are drawn. Cultural mediation of these events, especially the event of death, is a feature that has marked Homo sapiens from the earliest traceable record to contemporary literary productions. <clears throat> and um, whenever we write, uh, this is um, Kevin's, one of Kevin's points, whenever we write, we're, we're, we're bringing into our awareness, awareness of death, really. So, but cultural, but knowledge of the cultural forms or an inventory of the ways in which cultures must mediate bereavement should not belie the existential reality of birth and death for human persons and communities. And they're coming to terms with, with a reality of the world that transcends selfhood. Likewise, holiness as orientation towards verticality resists a cultural reductionism insofar as its existential reality is a motivating force and a movement of life towards which. So, for example, the life of the mystic Suran that um, Patrick Goujon uh, was writing about, has written about when he was here. Um, in 17th century France, while being framed by birth and death, like everyone else, is moved by a sense of holiness and directionality to the vertical that controls his life. Experiencing what he regarded as madness, out of the depth of sorrow and distress, he developed an orientation to transcendence that we see in his letters, in which the existential import of holiness has, is heightened as his life's highest meaning. The experience of transcendence came to dominate his life such that de Soto came to turn the adjective mystical, mystique, into a noun, la mystique. Suran is an example of the way in which cultural affordances that um, Joe talk about, talked about the other day, in which these cultural affordances give access to holiness and allow us to press into holiness, as it were. So the human reality of Dasein, inframed by birth and death, is primarily an existential reality rooted in the experience of being born and dying. Only within this structure uh, can we make sense of holiness, which itself is a lens through which to make sense of the source from which we, are, from which we arrive and the immediate goal to which we journey. But the existentiality of a life is not without location and is embedded and embodied in world. Dasein is always embodied, which entails communication with other bodies and the life world as the milieu within which it lives. Holiness as orientation and telos is experienced within the body and within a comportment in the present and projects a future only because of my particularity, and such particularity entails embodiment. My comportment towards world is to be a body in a certain way and a specific kind of subjectivity. Um, now I want to rush through this a bit. So becoming who you are, Heidegger somewhat mysteriously claims that we are left as a task to ourselves, the task of becoming who we are. And this notion of, of life as task of becoming means that person, persons are orientated towards a future and forward and a, and a forward trajectory of life that for Heidegger is fundamentally being towards death as a central structure of human existence experience. The, temp the temporal thrust of persons towards the future, Heidegger's thrownness of Dasein, means that persons care for their situation and are also fearful about it. Care and anxiety are central features of Heidegger's analytic of Dasein as we saw last year. But it's equally true that persons are constrained by the event of birth as Romano argues. And this event sets the scene for future possibility and allows for the creation of selfhood, of coming to be who we are with force as equal to the anticipation of the self's annihilation. This perception of human life as task characterized by care and fear for Heidegger is important for understanding life as directional and narratively structured. We can translate Heidegger's idea that we are a task to ourselves, the forward thrust of becoming 
into the idea of the particularity of a life as narratively structured. So the person is the story of who she or he was and who she or he is, and as who say claims of what she has to be. On this view, becoming a person is not simply the sum of the past of the good and bad decisions we have made, but is also the desire to be of, in who says terms of wanting to want oneself. Wanting to want yourself is a way of saying that we make sense of life through exposing its narrative structure to ourselves. But such a narrative structure of life is intimately linked to the narrative of others and the totality of narratives forms a complex web of history. The memory of who the person is, the narrative response to the question, who am I, is inseparably part of history of the collectivity of narratives and events that make up the temporal thrust of civilizations through time. So the sum of particular memories becomes the collective memory that constitutes history as Ricoeur has discussed at length. One of the ways, the dominant way in sec until secular modernity in which individual persons have made sense of their life is to reflectively understand life in relation to a wider narrative that they perceive as holy as the collective narrative of a people. Taking Husay's idea of becoming a person as wanting to want yourself. We might say that holiness is part of such a desire to become fully who one is. This means that with holiness, we have an orientation towards verticality and a sense of becoming that moves towards the notion of fullness or completion. This means that holiness is not a static idea, but an orientation or even stronger than this, a drive towards a fuller life, a fuller future, a state of completion or fulfillment. Now, this is not a perennial philosophy because such a view respects the radical difference in conceptions of perfectibility across civilizations. But it is a universalist perspective. It is a universalist view in the sense of recognizing such a human drive and the instigation of cultural forms that articulate models of the goal as process in the process of becoming. The narrative web of human lives is always future orientated and sometimes or, or, or often the narrative drive is impelled by a desire to become complete or full with a sense of life that is believed to be accessing a cosmological structure an openness to, to a cosmos, as Oliver was talking about, that individual life is part of a cosmological scheme that itself is always eludes complete articulation. So freedom and openness, um, another couple of minutes uh, and then I'll be finished. Furthermore, uh, the view of a person as necessarily the embodiment of person or what Husey calls open selfhood of the person who is time, flesh and will end quote, is contrasted with what Husey calls, quote, the closed identity of the mask, open quote, end quote, the closed identity of the mask, the person as purely social, or one might say legal identity. So the concept of holiness I'm arguing for, then, is therefore one in which holiness is constitutive of person understood as free enactment of a narrative identity that is orientated towards eschatological hope and a verticality, not necessarily as negation of world, but as ordering of world in the light of vertical reality. Uh, th this is to place the concept of, of person between the individual transcendental ego on the one hand and the person purely as mask and social role on the other. Here person as is a human achievement able to enact their sense of becoming within the narratives into which they are born, within which holiness is an orientation towards verticality and eschatological hope, always enacted in the particularity of a life in the affirmation of person in embodied act. Returning to Husay for a moment, this idea of becoming a person is wanting to want yourself 
and the possibility of failure in doing that indexes how the fullness or completion of person does not fall into despair uh, sorry um, indexes how the fullness or completion of person that does not fall into despair depends upon a human reality in which there is an orientation towards going beyond towards the formation of selfhood that reaches beyond the failure to be who we are becoming holy is part of a process then culturally constrained which is which recognizes which is recognizable sorry across geographies and histories so towards verticality but what sort of narrative accompanies holiness as orientation to verticality with holiness in relation to a telos of perfectibility, the, the accompanying narrative of such a view would entail some kind of account of a shift from a reduced or thin conception of life to a, a full conception of life uh, in that final perfectibility. This account would be distinct from the Gnostic narrative of classical verticality, which is so problematic in the contemporary global context. So here the person is a human achievement, able to enact their sense of becoming within the narratives into which they are born, which, in which holiness is an orientation towards verticality and eschatological shape, always enacted in the particularity of a life in the affirmation of, of person in the body and act. So then just um, last paragraph to summarize what I'm trying to say, to bring this discussion to a conclusion, we, we've argued here that holiness is intimately connected to the category of the person, and that to understand person is to recognize the frame of being born and dying within which meanings established through the cultures in which we find ourselves are holy to the extent that they articulate a journey towards some transcendent telos. I put transcendent in inverted commas, maybe an open telos might be better. This is to recognize the impulse and intentionality towards holiness as part of the structure of what person is linked to the notions of dignity and selfhood that Hans Joas has articulated, along with a sense of moving towards a goal outside of the self. This is also to understand uh, the self in terms of an opening and realizing selfhood that is not Husserlian or platonic isolation, but a recognition of temporal situatedness and direction. A secular phenomenology as philosophical anthropology has the ability to reveal structures of the human person as having a comportment towards world and trans-narrative embodiment in which the story of a particular life that is orientated towards verticality also participates in the greater narrative accounts of self. On this view, we press into holiness through the cultural affordances that we find available to us in the histories and the stories of which we are a part. The end. Thank you for listening. <laughs>